No one loved Luke more than Craig, his father. What I can say is, is it, it's, a, it's a horrific scene. We've got the death of a young boy. You're now insulting my right of intelligence. Right? And you're denying my right to legally represent myself by saying I do not wish to answer them. We have to look at the safety of women and children and not place the onus of responsibility onto their shoulders. Today's case is yet another tragic story that involves one man who simply couldn't control his own emotions and took it out on everyone around him. And even after this man threatened violence, caused physical harm, and showed red flag after red flag, the system continued to ignore it and let him slip by, all leading to his final act of violence. The way this case played out is truly devastating and sickening, and once you hear the details of this case, I know you'll be just as frustrated as I am. But before we get into this tragic, horrific case, if you're in the market for a new pair of earbuds that deliver premium audio at half the cost of bigger brands, then you are going to want to hear from today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon's everyday earbuds make your everyday just a little easier. Anytime they update the product like they did just recently, they add more features to make them even easier to use. These new and improved earbuds offer everything you love about Raycons plus more. You can enjoy the new ergonomic design, multi-point connectivity that lets your pair connect to two devices at once, and you get active noise cancellation. They also come in a variety of new, vibrant colors that complement any and all skin tones. I personally snagged a pair of the Forest Green earbuds, which I think are so cute and unique. I've really been into these kind of greens lately. I personally use my Raycons every single day for working out and listening to music and podcasts. I've also been traveling so much this month, hello out-of-state weddings, and my Raycons have been a lifesaver on all of these long flights. But sometimes I do forget to charge them, which can be a pain. But the new Raycons offer a new quick charge function, which delivers 90 minutes of battery time with just a 10 minute charge, which is literally perfect for when I forget to charge them. I just put them on the charger while I'm on the way to the gym or the airport or whatever, and boom, I have the perfect amount of battery life. Then when fully charged, they still have an amazing battery life, offering eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. The other thing I love about the new everyday earbuds is the multi-point connectivity. It was really nice to have on all those flights I've been taking. I connected them to both my phone for music and then to my iPad when I wanted to watch a movie. It was so nice being able to seamlessly switch between both on the plane without having to disconnect and reconnect them. The other feature I love is their noise isolation versus awareness modes. The noise isolation feature allows you to be totally immersed in your music and block out outside noise, which is nice for when I just want to be dialed in while doing my cardio at the gym, but I also like the awareness mode for when I'm listening to something on the go. For example, when I'm walking my dog around the neighborhood, I want to make sure that I'm aware of my surroundings at all times, so awareness mode allows me to listen to my podcasts while also being aware of what's going on around me. I know you'll love your Raycons just as much as I love mine, so go ahead and give them a try for yourself. Click the link in the description box below or head to buyraycon.com RSTC to get 20 to 50% off your purchase site-wide. That's right, you can get up to 50% off on everything on Raycon's website when you go to buyraycon.com slash RSTC. Thank you again so much to Raycon for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrific case of Luke Batty. Rosie Batty was born in East Midlands County in Nottinghamshire, England. There, she grew up on a farm with her two younger brothers, Robert and John. When Rosie was only six years old, her mother tragically died of peritonitis. Obviously, this was such a devastating blow to the family, and being that Rosie and her brothers were so young, they grew up with a lot of questions and confusion about why they would never see their mother again. Despite the struggles, though, she made the most of her life. She was raised by her father alongside nannies and her maternal grandmother who loved her and her brothers. She was surrounded by her farm animals and a family who raised her to develop a strong work ethic and resilience. After graduating high school, Rosie really didn't have much of a plan in life. She started work as a bank clerk, but she knew that she had a desire to travel the world. 
First, she got a job in Austria before making her way to Australia in 1986, where she continued work as a secretary, then as a nanny. For the years that followed, she worked, made friends, and traveled more. She returned back to the UK for some time, but came back to Australia to live more long-term. There, she settled in Melbourne, eventually buying a home in the suburbs. At some point during her time in Australia in 1992, Rosie met Greg Anderson. The two worked together at a recruitment agency and soon started a relationship that lasted two years. However, after those two years, Rosie broke up with Greg. Apparently, he showed some concerning signs of being controlling and possessive and sexually aggressive as well, so this definitely wasn't something Rosie needed in her life. After the breakup, for the eight years that followed, Rosie completely cut off contact with Greg. However, by around 2001, Rosie found herself feeling a bit isolated. She was in her early 40s. She was still single while most of her friends were married with children. It was during this time when she ran back into her ex, Greg. The two got to talking, eventually rekindling things, which led them to sleeping together. After this, Rosie actually fell pregnant. By June of 2002, Rosie gave birth to baby Luke Batty. Now, Rosie never had planned to be a mother. It simply wasn't something she had ever really wanted, and frankly, she was scared to have a child. Ever since the death of her mother, she had this deep-rooted fear of losing anybody she was close to. She was afraid that if she let herself love, whether it be a partner or a child, that she would just lose them. However, after Luke's birth, all of Rosie's fears melted away and were replaced with a strong, unbreakable bond and love for her child. She would do anything to protect him. Throughout the pregnancy, Rosie and Greg had no plans to stay together. They maintained contact, but Greg had no interest in being a father at first. But after Luke was born, Greg decided that he did want to be a part of his son's life. And for Rosie, it was important that her child have both parents in his life. After all, she grew up without a mother. So they worked together to co-parent Luke to the best of their abilities. However, as time went on with Greg being involved in Luke's life and them all spending time together as a family, the red flags Rosie originally broke up with Greg over started to re-emerge. It started as verbal abuse. Anytime Greg would become upset, he could fly off the handle and would start making threats against Rosie. He tried to intimidate Rosie, saying that he would kill her or her farm animals. This continued for three years, with Rosie having one side of her who wanted Greg to be involved in Luke's life because, after all, most kids do best when they have two parents in their lives. But, at the same time, she feared him. Through all of it, though, she never felt that Greg could ever hurt Luke. He never threatened Luke. He never said a bad word to or about him. He had high standards for Luke, trying to teach him good morals. He even told him, we never use our fists, we use our words. Yes, Greg hurt Luke emotionally by him having to witness how he treated his mother, but Greg never hurt Luke or even threatened him. That is why she continued to let him see his son for at least the first few years of his life. But then, by the time Luke was just three years old, Rosie's fears that Greg would turn violent were confirmed. Greg had become so angry that he physically attacked Rosie. He flew into a rage, then threw Rosie against a wall, holding her there by the skin on her neck. He then shoved her to the ground, all while screaming at her, threatening to knock her into next week. This all happened right in front of three-year-old Luke. At this point, Rosie knew that she needed to get police involved. This was now going beyond threats and intimidation and was now getting violent. However, when she called the police, they never officially filed the charges. Obviously, this was incredibly frustrating for Rosie, who started to feel like Greg would never have to take accountability for his actions. After this first incident, which was sometime in 2005, Rosie got to work writing her own will. Greg had threatened her multiple times that if she ever stopped him from seeing Luke, he would kill her. 
she was terrified that he would make good on that threat. So she wanted to make sure everything was taken care of in the event that she could no longer protect Luke. As all of this was happening, Rosie had actually met a new man with whom she started a new relationship. For the five years that she was in this relationship, the abuse from Greg took a pause. He backed off and Rosie lived with Luke happily and safe. Things were good. But then this relationship with the new man ended and as soon as that happened, Greg was back in her life causing chaos and turmoil. And by May of 2012, the violence made its way back into Rosie's life. Greg flew into one of his rages, and this time he attacked Rosie, threatening to beat her with a vase. This was all in front of Luke, who is now old enough to understand what was going on. During the attack, Luke grabbed the phone to dial triple zero. He reported what was happening to his mom, but police took quite a while to arrive, so the situation was still absolutely terrifying for Luke, who would have been almost 10 at the time. Luke would later tell the authorities that during the attack, he tried pulling his father off of his mother, but he was too little. He wishes he could be bigger because maybe then he could have protected his mother. Absolutely heartbreaking to hear. After the assault, once police finally responded, Greg was arrested and charged with the assault. The following day, a risk assessment was done on the family, and it was determined that both Rosie and Luke should be identified as protected persons and that the probability of future harm was very likely. That is when an order of protection was issued against Greg. However, after the initial arrest, he was released, and the charges took several months to be authorized due to workload issues. Once the charges were finally filed, they had issues with serving them to Greg. So by January of 2013, they had to be refiled and reissued. And finally, at that time, they were served to Greg. But before those first charges were filed, there was another incident reported to police. By January 3rd, 2013, Greg went to Rosie's home and threatened to kill her. Thankfully, this time, Luke was not present, but of course, Rosie still got police involved. Once police arrived, Greg had already left at that point, and since he wasn't there, police said that they too were going to leave since they were no longer needed. But Rosie expressed the severity of the situation, asking police to stay. It actually took some convincing for police to stay a bit longer, but it was a good thing they did because they were ultimately able to find and arrest Greg. At that time, the officers truly got a look into just how scary of a situation Rosie really was in. Greg was a large dude, standing at over six feet tall with a large build. If he truly wanted to hurt Rosie, or even worse, he easily could. After the arrest, police took Greg in for an interview where they read him his rights and explained why he was taken in. In that interview, it was clear that Greg was argumentative and combative. He refused to answer any questions, accusing officers of denying him his rights. After throwing his little tantrum, they continued asking questions, but Greg got up and went and sat in the corner to pout. At that point, officers stopped the interview. I intend to interview you in relation to making threats to kill and making threats to inflict serious injury and use unregistered motor vehicle. Before continuing, I must inform you, you do not have to say or do anything, but anything you say or do may be given in evidence. Do you understand that? I do. So I don't wish to say anything. Matt is finished. I wish to leave. Yep, that's your right. I'll just read you this right as well. I must also inform you of your rights. You have the right to communicate with or attempt to communicate with your friend or relative to inform that person of your whereabouts. You have the right to communicate with or attempt to communicate with a legal practitioner. If you are not a citizen or permanent resident of Australia, you have the right to communicate with or attempt to communicate with the consular office of the country of which you are a citizen. Do you what, understand these rights? What right do you think you have to hold me for what? I'll get to that. I'll what just... right do you have got to have me here at all? Do you understand the rights that have just been read to you? I, re I understand what you've read, read to me. I, I want to know why you think that you've got a right to hold me at all. Okay. Do you wish to exercise any of these rights before the interview proceeds? Well, the, the interview's finished. I said I do not wish to comment. Okay. They have right. nothing. There is nothing. Yep. So let's move on. In fairness to yourself, I just need to get through these questions and then whatever you want to say after that, we can do I that. I said I don't wish to say anything. So how can there be questions and answers? You're now insulting my right of intelligence. 
Right. Are you denying my right to legally represent myself by saying I do not wish to answer them? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? No, I don't. I'm not denying you a right, that's why I'm asking you. You've denied me because I told you I do not wish to answer anything. Yep. That's right. Now you're going to ask me a list of questions. Yep. You've denied me the right. Okay. So at this point in time, do you wish to exercise the right to call a lawyer or no. friend or relative? No. no. I wish to leave. If you have nothing, I wish to leave. You've arrested me before, it's gone through the court, you've had nothing. Okay. You've got the same person lying again. Yep. All right. We'll just back up a bit. What's your age and date of birth? You still have that information from before. Yep. It's on my driver's license. You're asking me questions of that. And I said I would not ask questions, mm -hmm. and you're still firing at me. Mm -hmm. You again have not exercised the right that you asked in the beginning mm -hmm. that I could have. Yep. You're denying me my right by asking me my questions. Top hand, constable. Okay. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are. If I say the year date of birth, the 3rd of November 1959, would you agree? Okay. I'm going to suspend the interview at this time due to uh, no participation from the accused. After this interview, the responding officer requested a higher bail for Greg so that he wouldn't be released. He was violating the order of protection, and again, he was an unstable, aggressive man who clearly could overpower Rosie due to his size. He was dangerous. Despite these concerns, though, his bail was reduced and he was let go. The only stipulations he was given was that he was not allowed to go to the suburb where Rosie and Luke lived and where Luke went to school and played cricket, which to me is absolutely ridiculous because he was already ordered to stay away from them. So why they thought this added stipulation would do anything is beyond me. After being released on bail, the courts took another several months to process these new charges as well as the original charges. Yup, at this point, those original charges from the month prior still had not been addressed in court. Finally, by April of 2013, Rosie was called to court to give her evidence against Greg of him threatening and abusing her. At this time, she told the courts of another incident that happened recently when Luke was alone with his dad. His dad was driving with Luke in the car when he pulled out a knife, showed it to Luke, and told him it could all end with this. When Rosie found out about that, she realized that whatever trust she had in Greg not to hurt their son was completely gone. Now, he had threatened both Luke and Rosie, and that was absolutely the last straw. Up until this point, there had been assessments done by Child Protective Services to determine if Greg could continue seeing Luke. After that first incident in May, it was determined that Rosie was doing enough as a protective parent, so no further action was needed from Child Protective Services. The assumption was made that even though Greg was abusive and explosive towards Rosie, that didn't mean he couldn't be a good father, despite the fact that his behaviors caused Luke a ton of emotional distress, so much so that he needed counseling. That wasn't enough to deem him an abusive father. The system felt that Rosie was equipped to handle Greg on her own, that she was fully capable of protecting Luke against him. She didn't need help from family and child services. Again, despite the fact that she had an order of protection out against him. This was the perspective of family and child services. However, by April of 2013, when Rosie reported the knife incident, the courts did grant a no contact order for both Luke and Rosie, banning him from having any contact with either of them. From there, Greg would be in and out of jail a few different times, once for child pornography offenses, which Rosie was actually completely unaware of. She was never told of these charges until much later. But again, despite the new charges and several old charges, Greg continued to be released. And to the surprise of absolutely no one, anytime he was released from jail, he continued to breach his orders. Later that month in April, Greg showed up to watch Luke play football and he taunted Rosie the entire time. After this, police urged Rosie to notify them right away next time Greg turned up to a practice so they could arrest him. But the next time he showed up and Rosie reported it, police showed up but couldn't arrest him. I guess they couldn't get an arrest warrant in time, so they just sat there and watched Greg watch Luke at his football practice. Again, despite 
actively breaching his orders. By May, he continued to breach his orders, showing up to Luke's practices and even visiting him at school. Later that same month, after showing up to one of the practices, he was finally arrested and held in jail for two weeks. But once again, he was released in order to have no contact with Luke or Rosie. Once again, despite the fact that Greg spent months on end ignoring orders, he continued to be released from jail, being told time and time again to stop contacting Luke and Rosie. Each time, I guess they thought, this time he'll finally listen, despite him not listening to any of our orders any other time. But these orders actually did not last long. Greg felt that he had every right to see his son despite everything that happened, and by July of 2013, he argued with the court that he be allowed to see his son. And that same month, the order preventing Greg from seeing Luke was indeed dropped. He was now allowed to see and spend time with Luke on the weekends as long as they were in public places. This allowed Greg to attend some of Luke's football and cricket practices and games, which he had always really enjoyed. At this point, Rosie went along with the ruling, feeling that it was probably best to just appease Greg for the time being. She felt that if she just allowed Greg to see Luke under safe, supervised conditions, that maybe Greg would chill out. She was afraid of what Greg could do if he saw Luke in a private setting, but she felt that being in public, surrounded by other people, that Luke was safe. Rosie would later go on to describe that during this time, Greg's life was in shambles. He lost his home, he had no job, and everything around him was failing. Luke was the only positive thing he had in his life, so maybe seeing him would calm things down and allow the three of them to coexist in peace. By February of 2014, things had been going well. Overall, things were about as peaceful as they could be given the circumstances. The morning of February 12th, 2014 started as a normal day for Luke and his mother. Luke was now in the sixth grade and he excitedly headed off to school, ready to see his friends. Rosie picked him up from school that day, showing right up outside of his classroom. Being that Luke was now 13, he pretended not to see his mom at first. He was embarrassed to hold her hand in front of his classmates. But when it was time to go, she gave him a quick hug and left the school. That night, Luke was feeling lazy and didn't want to go to his cricket practice. He wanted to play his PS3 with his friends and stay home. But he had a commitment to his team, so his mom made him follow through and go to practice. As they headed to the practice, Luke was apprehensive because he wasn't sure whether his father would be there. He hadn't seen his dad in a while as they had just gone on holiday and were visiting other family members. Once they arrived at practice, Luke spotted his dad. Greg stood up with a huge smile, appearing to be in a great mood. This immediately made both Rosie and Luke feel better, seeing that Greg was happy and excited. It made them feel like things would go really smoothly. Luke was actually happy that his dad was there to watch his practice because he always enjoyed his dad being a part of it all, just like all the other dads were. After practice, Luke ran up to his mom, all excited and animated, asking her if he could spend an extra few minutes with his dad to practice cricket with him. Greg could see just how much Luke was improving in his sport, and he was proud of him. Luke wanted to continue showing off to his father for just a little bit after practice. Of course, Rosie said this was just fine. So off Luke went back to the field, practicing near the nets with his dad. At this point, the two were alone on the field, though they were surrounded by all of the other families who had just gotten done with practice. However, shortly after Luke and Greg went over by the net, an eight-year-old boy watched from afar as Greg raised the cricket bat over his shoulder and brought it back down with force. The boy didn't see anything after that, but this concerned him enough that he ran to his dad, telling him to call the authorities. By the time first responders arrived, they found that Luke was lying on the ground, unresponsive, and Greg was kneeling on the ground next to him. Both of them were covered in blood. At this time, first responders didn't know what to think. They initially thought that Greg was helping his son. But as they continued approaching them, Greg yelled to them that Luke is now in heaven. He was holding up a knife, yielding it at the first responders. Turns out, pretty much as soon as Greg got Luke alone by those nets, 
he struck his son multiple times with a cricket bat before pulling out a knife and stabbing him. He then began to stab himself. By this point, police officers had also arrived on scene and were attempting to calm down the situation and get Greg to surrender. They made a circle around Greg, ordering him to drop the knife. He didn't, and he actually began to lunge at one of the officers with the knife, resulting in that officer shooting Greg to stop him from hurting anybody else. After he went down, paramedics got him into an ambulance for treatment, but as they did so, Greg asked them to let him die and Greg would ultimately die from his injuries. And tragically, 13-year-old Luke also died as a result of the attack carried out by his own father. We've had an absolute tragedy occur here tonight about 6.40 p.m. The police have arrived and they've been confronted by a male, about 50 years old, um, armed with a knife. Uh, they've attempted to use leth less than uh, lethal force, uh, foam. It's been unsuccessful. They have then discharged a firearm, shooting that male once in the chest. He's at the Alfred Hospital at the moment in a life-threatening condition. A further examination of the scene has um, revealed uh, the body of a 12-year-old boy. The male that the police shot was the father of the deceased boy. We've heard some pretty horrific stories of the man. Um, when police arrived, the man was bashing the kid with a cricket bat. Can you confirm that? What I can say is, is it, it's, a, it's a horrific scene. We've got the death of a young boy. Um, his mother is um, clearly uh, absolutely distraught and our thoughts and prayers go out to her and the extended family. Now going back just a bit as the attack was first happening, I don't believe Rosie saw the actual attack take place, but she did notice a commotion when that eight-year-old boy ran to his dad to call triple zero. She saw Luke lying on the ground injured, so she too called for help. She went into a state of panic as first responders arrived and as she watched Greg be shot by police, only to find that Luke was dead from his injuries. Of course, this was all just incredibly traumatizing and Rosie was in a state of shock. Violence happens to everybody, no matter how nice your house is, how intelligent you are. The distraught mother of an 11-year-old boy savagely stabbed and beaten to death by his father, Greg Batty, after cricket practice. The incident happened in Tyab, Victoria, in Australia, as parents and children watched on in horror. Rosie Batty spoke to reporters on Thursday morning and revealed her estranged husband had a history of violence and mental illness. She also paid tribute to her son. He was effervescent, he was funny. <laughs> He wasn't the best scholar, but he was intelligent. He enjoyed his school at Flinders. 54-year-old Greg Batty was shot by police at the scene and later died in hospital. Rosie told reporters that Greg had suffered from an undiagnosed mental illness for two decades. No one loved Luke more than Greg, his father. No one loved Luke more than me. We both loved him. After all of this happened, of course, friends, family, and the community around Luke and Rosie were all devastated. Rosie always feared that something like this would happen. She knew that Greg was violent, and after that incident with Greg showing Luke the knife, she knew that Luke's life was also in danger. She did absolutely everything she could to protect Luke, going to the courts numerous times, taking out orders of protection, and getting police involved any time something happened. But she never thought that Greg would act out this way in a public place. This was so shocking to everyone who learned of what happened. Due to how all of this went down, with Greg slipping by every time, never fully facing consequences for his actions, always being let out of jail, always being granted bail, an inquest was done to see what mistakes were made and if those mistakes could have prevented Luke's death. This inquest found many factors that contributed to what happened. First, it discussed the many, many mental health issues Greg had shown all throughout this whole thing. He was clearly unstable, very emotionally volatile, and uncooperative with any sort of authority. Greg refused to get help for his mental health and basically allowed it to control his life. 
he allowed himself to spiral out of control and negatively impact everyone around him. Anytime he had interactions with police, he was dismissive, aggressive, and uncooperative. He purposely missed court appearances, refused to follow court orders, and constantly played the victim in every scenario. As we saw from that earlier interview, he said his rights were being violated, boo freaking who. He refused to answer questions, and overall, he proved himself to be a very unpleasant person to work with. Yet still, despite all of the red flags that police clearly saw, despite his history of violence and threatening the lives of those around him, he was always let out, always given bail, and always given these orders, despite the court knowing very well that he wasn't going to follow through. Then, as we heard from earlier, many of the charges Greg did receive stayed in the court system for months and were never actually heard, once again due to workload issues. Now, like I said, police knew that Greg was belligerent and uncooperative and knew of his past history of violence. This inquest also found that a former roommate of Greg's had also taken order of protection out against him. Police had reportedly been searching for him, unable to find him to serve him his order. However, just two weeks before Luke's death, Rosie had actually contacted the authorities to inform them of his address. After learning of his address, four officers went to the home to serve him with the order. They knew that Greg was prone to outbursts and was very combative, so that is why they wanted four officers to go to his home. However, at that time, there were also warrants out for Greg's arrest. But when those officers looked into the system and ran their background check to make sure they, you know, saw everything that was out for him, they did not find any outstanding warrants. So although he was served with the order of protection, he was not arrested despite having multiple warrants out. Essentially, there was a glitch in the system that made it so these officers missed those warrants. That being said, a lot of people have looked at this as possibly a contributing factor into Luke's death. Had he been arrested, he may have been held in jail for the weeks after. This may have prevented him from seeing Luke altogether, therefore preventing Luke's death. However, because he was never arrested, we truly don't know how long he would have been detained for. Given the history, he probably would have been released immediately and he would have carried out this attack the same way or at a later date. We truly don't know if this would have prevented Luke's death. And to me, even though it does seem like a very, very big mess up in the whole thing, I also don't know if I think it would have prevented anything from happening because I think once Greg had this idea in his head that he was going to kill Luke, he was going to do it regardless of what happened. Several officers also spoke up during the inquest saying that they also felt more could have been done. Even they knew how disturbed of a man Greg was. They had to deal with him numerous times, and every time, they saw just how evil he truly was. They spoke about how he clearly had mental health issues, yet they were never addressed. They said that each time they went to the courts, hoping to get the situation under control, hoping to get him behind bars for an extended period of time, the courts just let him out. Officers who worked with Greg all said that Greg was intelligent and knew how to play the system, and it worked for him every single time. Knowing all of this information, you can see that there were tons of opportunities for the courts to have done more. They could have denied bail after seeing how uncooperative he was. They could have actually heard the charges against Greg instead of letting them sit in limbo for months. They could have kept him in jail for longer periods each time he was arrested for doing the same shit over and over and over again. Yet none of those things happened, and because of that, a 13-year-old boy was murdered in broad daylight in front of his own mother and several other families. The inquest did find several missed opportunities to get Greg involved in the mental health system. The inquest found that Greg suffered from delusional disorder and that he often switched between rational and irrational thoughts and behaviors. They found several times when Greg should have been detained longer and denied bail. They found that the glitch in the system prevented Greg from being arrested despite having several warrants out for his arrest. But with that being said, with these findings, it was determined that Luke's death could not have been foreseen, especially since it happened in broad daylight. 
The inquest also praised Rosie for how she handled and continues to handle the situation to this day. She did everything she could as a mother. There was nothing more she could have done because at a certain point, it is up to the courts and the system to follow through on the orders they have in place. I'm really pleased with Judge Gray's findings. I think he's done what I always set out to do, which is to um, highlight systemic failings, but not apportion personal blame. People do the best they can with their training, with the information they have available, and with the resources they have. This could have been prevented if we review how we work together. We have to look at the issues around privacy. We have to look how to work in a more integrated, collaborative manner. We have to look at the safety of women and children and not place that onus of responsibility onto their shoulders. We absolutely have to make perpetrators accountable. Luke's findings helped me realise, and through the journey before the inquest, Greg was never made accountable. Not once. This is unacceptable. And the biggest change we need to see is how we effectively intervene with perpetrators and work to stop the violence. In the aftermath of all of this, Rosie has been very outspoken about the system and how it desperately needs to change. She believes that the system heavily favors the rights of violent parents rather than the children who need protection, and I absolutely 100% agree with that because we see it so often in these cases. She had to do custody visits with Greg despite telling them how violent he was and despite how he threatened their lives. Because as I stated earlier, there was a time where Rosie wanted Greg in Luke's life because she wanted both parents in his life. But after he threatened her and after he physically abused her, and especially after he threatened Luke with that knife, she completely wanted him out of their lives. Yet the courts would not help with that and they would not follow through with the orders that they had in place. She continued to have to do custody visits with Greg despite how violent he was and despite how he threatened both of their lives. She talked about how the courts determined that yes, Greg is a violent person and a bad partner, but that doesn't mean he's a bad father. Rosie said that that isn't possible. And again, I totally agree. I absolutely do not think it's possible for a man or a woman to be violent and abusive towards their partner and then still be a good parent. It's absolutely been shown time and time again that even people who can keep on their best behavior towards the child for years, they will eventually turn on them and hurt their children. Even if it is done as a way to hurt that significant other or the other parent, they always end up hurting their child in one way or another, whether it be physically or mentally. Mentally. By 2015, after everything Rosie had done to keep Luke's name alive and spread awareness on family violence, she was named that year's Australian of the Year, a very deserving honor. And to this day, Rosie continues to speak out and shine a light on family and domestic violence. She has worked with the government tirelessly to try and get new laws put into place and to just make people aware of the red flags that led to this kind of violence. It always starts with disrespect and violence towards women and progresses from there. Also, about a year after Luke's death, Rosie published a book, an autobiography called A Mother's Story, which goes more in depth about her perspective of how this all happened, the grief it caused her, and how she continues to push through it all to help others and to help our society work towards stopping this kind of family violence. Of course, it's always amazing to see people who take this kind of horror and tragedy in their lives and turn turn it into something positive, and Rosie hasn't stopped in her efforts to spread awareness and keep Luke's story alive, and I absolutely admire Rosie for that. But at this point, that is all I have for today's case. Of course, this was a tragic, devastating case that absolutely should not have been allowed to happen the way that it did. It's always so freaking frustrating to see all of these missed opportunities, see how many times Greg just slipped through the cracks and was allowed to continue his terror, and to know that he was so desperate to hurt Rosie that he decided to take his own son's life in public 
It's just insane. Of course, my heart goes out to Luke, his friends, family, and everyone else who loved him and has been affected by this horrific death. But again, I'm so happy to see that Rosie is able to take this tragedy and do what she can to help others. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. And now I wanna know what you all think of this. Why do you think Greg murdered his own son? Was it because he wanted to die by suicide by police or was it to hurt Rosie or both? Do you think that Luke's death could have been prevented? If so, how? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.